The creation of hybrid vegetables and fruits by Luther Burbank in the early 20th century testified to humanity's mastery over scientific selection. He could create specialized varieties of plants which suggested the science of bioengineering, of rearranging biological forms to suit one's purpose. The Russian scientist Pavlov trained a dog to salivate at the sound of a bell. He conditioned the dog's responses. He engineered his psychology and thus gave mankind potential control over the human mind. And humanity was quick to respond. Nazi Germany quickly became a master of psychological warfare and produced the horrors of Auschwitz, where inhuman experiments on captive millions were done in the name of scientific advancement. Science has always been made to serve society, but often in ways not foreseen by scientists. Atrocities were far from the intentions of Burbank and Pavlov, but became realities nevertheless. Aldous Huxley, in his novel of a negative utopia, entitled Brave New World, creates a world of the future in which bioengineering and psychoconditioning are used to serve the dictates of a centralized, all-powerful world state. In the antiseptic programmed society of Brave New World, Huxley shows us and warns us of the dire threats that a world where science serves power can hold for humanity. Brave New World is a novel of the future, of what humanity might become. Its title is taken from Shakespeare's The Tempest, O oh, Brave New World that has such people in it, and is a cry of frustration and despair. In the Brave New World, people are conditioned from birth by hypnopedia or sleep teaching to conform to the ideas of their predetermined class. Failure to respond correctly is punished by electric shocks and loud noises, methods similar to those of Pavlov. Social classes are not determined by individual initiative, nor by economic standing. People are born into their class, or rather, bioengineered. Size, strength, looks, intelligence are all manufactured for a certain purpose. The Alpha Plus the highest class, for example, is intelligent and bred to do the work of the intelligentsia, while the Epsilon Minus, the lowest class, is short and stupid and manufactured for the coarsest manual labor. For all their lives, people remain in their class, doing the task for which they were literally created. The psychoconditioning reinforces their bioengineered purpose. This programmed assembly line birth takes place in the hatcheries. There are no longer families. In fact, the word mother is considered an obscenity. Hatchery and conditioning centers bear the slogan, community, identity, stability. The novel begins. The time is 600 years in the future, and the director of the hatcheries is conducting a group of students on a tour throughout the facility. Everything is sterile, efficient, and mechanical, especially the people. In the hatcheries, babies are being decanted in bottles. There are five classes being manufactured, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon. The Alphas are the leaders of the world state. Each member of each class is conditioned to be perfectly content with his station in life. Ten superior human beings called the world controllers make the decisions which govern the world state. Huxley himself, like Plato, believed in the necessity of a governing class, free from the ordinary inconveniences of daily life. But in his novel, such rulers are gross caricatures. As the students continue their tour, they constantly refer to Ford, the inventor of the assembly line, as if he were a god. And in fact, in the world state he is. Ford help us. Cleanliness is next to Fordliness. Fords in his flivver, all's well with the world, are common proverbs here. Ford has also become mixed up with Freud. Thus, the two gods of the world state are the god of industry and the god of psychology. 
Mustafa Mann, the world controller of Europe, joins the group and speaks to the awe-stricken students. He quotes Henry Ford, history is bunk, and he waves away the past. In the world state, there is no room for anything except the sterile, pointless, programmed present. In the hatcheries, the group encounters Bernard Marx. Though Bernard is central to the plot, Brave New World really has no single hero. In this pseudo-happy society, Bernard Marx is a misfit. As an Alpha Plus, he works in the Psychology Bureau, but he is alienated from his fellow intellectuals because he enjoys solitude. Rumor is that when he was decanted, alcohol was mistakenly added to his blood surrogate. Bernard is small, maladjusted, and neurotic, frustrated in his relationships with women, an outsider, and therefore more aware of the inadequacies of the world state. He's a source of annoyance to his superior, the director whose one goal is to get rid of him. He has one friend, Helmholtz Watson, who writes poetry and sympathizes with Bernard's dislike of the values of Huxley's utopia, but does not openly revolt against it. Helmholtz is Bernard's complete opposite, handsome, outgoing, well-adjusted, and popular. Bernard's attitude towards his friend is mixed with envy, and the subtle impression is that, given Watson's attributes, Marx, too, would be content. Marx's unhappiness, Huxley suggests, is not so much intellectual rebellion as it is a consequence of some minor breakdown of the machinery of the state. Though Helmholtz, who teaches advanced emotional engineering for third-year students, is not a major character, he serves to illustrate the attitude toward art and the artist in Brave New World. Bernard is also attracted to Lenina Crown, a pneumatic young woman who, contrary to conditioning, tends to form long-term relationships with the men, a tendency not encouraged by the society. But apart from this, Lenina is a perfect member of society. She indulges in all the rituals, mouths all the platitudes, accepts all the strictures, and is an avid consumer without real critical facility. Beauty, art, and solitude do not engender consumerism. Therefore, such attributes are avoided in the world state, and material and sexual comforts are substituted. Happiness is imposed upon the citizens. They have no choices. If upheavals arise, there are substitutes. Huxley was interested in research into a wonder drug which would creatively, without any ill effects, enable man to live in harmony with his fellow man. He added such a drug called Soma into his novel. Soma, though, induced not true harmony, but a drugged sort of non-existence and loss of sense. Lenina, like the others, is happily addicted to it. Bernard and Lenina finally get together, and the two of them go off for a week to a Pueblo Indian reservation, a place so primitive and desolate that it's never been developed and has been left in a state of nature. But Lenina spends most of her time hiding in the hotel, She's disgusted at the primitive conditions and takes refuge in Soma. Like all over-specialized beings, once removed from her refined environment, she collapses. Bernard, on the other hand, is happy and fascinated. This world appeals to his outsider personality. His delight increases when he discovers amid the Indians a man named John who is referred to as the Savage. John in the novel is the image of the noble savage. Pure, innocent, and free. He's not an Indian, although he was raised by them. His mother, Linda, had come to the reservation with a boyfriend, had gotten lost, and was later found by the Indians. She was pregnant. John was born and has been there ever since. John grew up lonely and bewildered, learning from his mother of the beautiful other place. Incongruously, he reads Shakespeare, speaks Elizabethan English, believes in God, and loves his mother. But like Bernard, John, too, is an outsider. He was never accepted by the Indians because of his own differentness. Bernard's interest in John increases when he discovers the identity of Linda's boyfriend. He was none other than the director of the hatcheries, Bernard's own antagonistic supervisor. Bernard sees in John, the innocent savage, and his now gross mother, Linda, perfect tools for revenge. He plans to take them back with him. 
John is delighted with Bernard's apparently generous suggestion and recalls Miranda's words in The Tempest. Oh, wonder how many goodly creatures are there here. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world. The reader's sympathies are transferred to John, and Bernard seems to be as brutal and unfeeling as the world's state in his plan to exploit such an innocent as the savage. They all depart. In London, the director of the hatchery is laughed out of the room and out of his position when Linda tries to embrace her former lover. Bernard's scheme seems to be working. The savage fascinates the society of the world state, but Linda is an embarrassment. Placed in a soma state, she is ignored. The savage grieves for her and rages against the heartlessness of those around him. Now he begins to wonder about the beauty of this, the other place. Bernard is totally happy now. Because of his sponsorship of the savage, he's become a celebrity. He accepts the world he had previously shunned, but inflated with success, he continues to criticize it. He's become a perfect bore, and he uses the savage like a social lever. To add to the savage's confusion, his burgeoning love for Lenina is reciprocated. She throws herself at him in the only way she knows, without any preliminary courtship or moral conditions. He is shocked, embarrassed, and repelled. The scene is comic, yet pathetic. All the promise of the brave new world is turning sour for the savage. Instead of beauty, he's found ugliness. Instead of truth, he's found lies. Instead of compassion, there is only a spiritless sense of immorality and brutality. Caught up in a moral and psychological dilemma, he shuts himself off from the world, refusing to meet any more of Marx's new friends. For Bernard, the savage's seclusion is a catastrophe. He is shunned and ridiculed and treated once more as before, an unattractive outcast. Now the crisis point of the novel is reached. Previously hospitalized, Linda dies from massive doses of soma, and the savage breaks into a frenzy. He harangues the deltas who work at the hospital and starts a riot. Bernard and Watson arrive on the scene. Bernard is terrified, but Watson is thrilled and joins the rioters. Police arrive to break up the mob. They arrest Mark, Watson, and the savage, and take them to the study of Mustafa Mann, the world controller. The three rioters face Mustafa Mann, and surprisingly, Mann begins a discussion about literature and about Shakespeare. He also shows them his bookcase, in which he keeps books like the Bible, the varieties of religious experience, the imitation of Christ, and many others considered obscene by the world state. The three are surprised, but as world controller, Mann has access to many things forbidden the average citizen. He is, in fact, well-read and intelligent. As the four talk, the theme of the novel is clearly stated. In this confrontation, they discuss the idea of a perfect world. Mann's idea is simple. Perfect peace calls for perfect order. He recounts the horrors of war and suffering that was humanity's lot till the world state took over and enforced peace through genetic and psychological programming. And now, Although peace is enforced, it's still peace, and everyone is happy. To Mond, people like Marx and Watson, aberrations, threaten this tranquility. Although he can sympathize with their rebellion, he cannot condone it. They must go. He sentences them to an island, a prison island, removed from society where they can no longer endanger the state. But, he says, they won't be alone. For on this island are all the rebels and misfits from society. In fact, he adds, they'll probably be very happy there. For the savage, though, he has a different fate. Although he, too, wants to go to the island, Mond won't let him. He must stay and be observed by scientists. The savage is horrified by this clinical, inhuman attitude and condemns Mond and the world state. Speaking as Huxley's figure of the free spirit, the savage cries out he believes in God, in poetry, in beauty, in freedom, all the things denied humanity by the state. Mond, as the voice of Nemesis, cynically counters, yes, all those things are gone, but so are unhappiness, aging, disease, dying, and fear. If the good is desired, 
so must the bad be desired. The savage emotionally replies, I claim them all. And Mond remarks, you're welcome to them. The interview ends on this calm, bitter, frustrating note. And the savage and his friends leave. The savage is still alone and still an outcast. Even his rebel friends have a place with others like themselves. For everyone but him, the state has a plan. The savage withdraws to a lonely lighthouse. He's confused, beaten, and despondent. And in his torment, he gives way to excess. He whips himself as if trying to feel in this unfeeling world. But even in this, he's frustrated. For crowds of people had gathered outside the lighthouse and observed him. They report the incident and more crowds come to watch and be entertained. Alone, hemmed in by mobs, unable to reconcile himself to anything, he begins to crumble. His peace and certainty is destroyed. And at this moment, Lenina comes to visit him. Pushed beyond the limit, he takes Soma and unreins his pent-up, confused passions. He's sunk to Lenina's mindless level. But the next morning, he awakes, alone. Utterly disgusted with himself, he contemplates his only vindication and escape, suicide. In a moment of resolution, he hangs himself. Thus, in the brave new world, the noble savage dies. His death is Huxley's final devastating comment on the inevitable loss of humanity in such a world. But even in death, there is no sense of victory for the savage. His death is a freak show for the masses who will quickly forget him and move on to other things. So ends Brave New World on a note of spiritual defeat. This is Huxley's warning, a warning which raises the question of what does a brave new world consist?